For those of you who are joining us in person and online, welcome. And thank you for coming to our session, jointly tackling disinformation and promoting human rights, organized by the African Union, European Union Digital for Development Hub, or more commonly referred to as the AU EU D4D Hub. My name is Eden. I'm an Ethiopian entrepreneur, journalist, and cybersecurity expert. And it is an honor and privilege to be here with you all today. This topic is one that's very near and dear to my heart, so very much looking forward to the discussion. But first, I want to quickly em em emphasize the importance of multi-stakeholder engagement, bringing together civil society, private sector, private sector, public sector, government, academia, to contribute meaningfully to the conversation and influence digital policies. Also very fitting with the spirit of IGF, I would say. While this information Sorry. While this information is very much a global issue, this discussion will focus on Africa-Europe perspectives and cooperation, which is really at the heart and scope of the AU-EU D4D Hub's work. Now I'd like to briefly turn your attention to Slido, which is a live quiz app that we will be using to interact with you, our audience, sporadically throughout the session. You can join Slido by scanning the QR code, which is um, plastered around the room for those of you who are in person. Um, and for our online audience, you can join by clicking the link. So please do take part, uh, whether you're joining us in person or virtually, and our team is also here to assist you if you have any questions. So the first question, which I'd like to turn your attention to on Slido, is which country are you from? Uh, and I assume being at the IGF, that we will have a nice uh, variety of responses. As we navigate into the fourth industrial revolution, we must keep our eyes and minds open to the challenges of digitalization, in particular disinformation which is something that needs to be addressed on a local, national, and transcontinental level. But first, what is disinformation? Simply put, disinformation is information intended to mislead people. With the prevalence of the internet across the world and subsequently the rise of social media platforms, disinformation has become increasingly weaponized against population by causing division, chaos, hatred, and uncertainty. And it's also causing a lot of damage politically, economically, and societally, but we'll get into that a bit later. All right, yeah, as, as suspected, we see an, a nice diversity of countries. Um, and I, yeah, so this is the live version, so we're getting more and more countries into the word cloud, that's great. Um, I'd like to turn your attention back to our favorite tool, Slido. Um, for those of you who are just joining us in the room, we are interacting using a live quiz app called Slido, and you're able to participate by scanning the QR code that's plastered around the room. Um, and so we will be asking a few questions sporadically throughout the session, so please do take part in that. So again, on Slido, I would like to introduce you to our second question which is, which sector do you represent? So please input your responses on the app. Um, you can choose between public sector, private sector, CSO, academia, or other. All right, that's great. We're getting some, some responses private sector and international cooperation, that's great. Also seeing people from civil society, private sector, academia, so very well represented, I think, from many groups. So in this discussion, we hope to gather a set of practical recommendations on how to best tackle disinformation while safeguarding um, human rights. And this will be gathered from inputs by you, the audience, and also our speakers. Now we turn to our esteemed speakers, Simone Tusi, Charlotte Carnell, and Odanga Madung. Thank you so much for being part uh, of this discussion with us today. 
Uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to remind our speakers to please keep your responses to three minutes. So, Simon, starting with you. You are a project officer at the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa, or in short, CIPESA. You're working closely at the intersection of policy, technology, democracy, and human rights. You focus on research, community engagement, and advocacy on African digital policies, and examine the interference with human rights and democratic processes, such as privacy laws, surveillance regulations, and government mechanisms to tackle disinformation in Africa. So, Simon, why have you focused particularly on multi-stakeholder collaboration in your research, and what do stakeholders need to collaborate better? Yeah, well, thank you, uh, thank you, Eden. Thank you, everyone. So, why we have focused on the multi-stakeholder collaboration on the research is uh, is the I will I will start by that uh, that question and then the, the second part. Well, the focus on multi-stakeholder collaboration was mainly because uh, we found that uh, disinformation is. A multifaceted uh, phenomenon that um, that implies all the stakeholders and uh, affect affects uh, democracy and human rights that are binding issues binding uh, stakes for all these stakeholders and when I say uh, stakeholders I think uh, we have not uh, defined it uh, yet when when we say multi stakeholder we mean at the same time uh, governments intergovernmental organizations we mean civil society we mean um, private sector media journalists and uh, yeah population and sometimes the acad and the ca academia as well so we have found that um, through the report mainly we found that uh, this information it manifest through many ways. It can be uh, deep fakes, it can be uh, identity theft, it can be, uh, well, man, many, other, many other forms of disinformation. And it is perpetrated by a diversity of actors. We have uh, these governments that I've, I have cited sometimes, they are carrying out of just political actors they are carrying out these information campaigns to either gain power or keep power. And uh, we may have uh, influencers. I'm just citing some examples. We may have influencers who carry out these information campaigns, maybe to help political actors. Sometimes they are paid to do that. And sometimes if for their private interests, just to push to, to, to widen their audience. We may have also uh, the information by uh, sometimes population, and that at that time we talk about misinformation. They receive false news without checking if it is false news, they display it on social network or their messaging applications. And uh, we found also that uh, this information sprays through social media, mainstream media, and these uh, messaging applications that I was talking about. Well, and the most important part is that sometimes the measures that uh, stakeholders use to tackle this information are not always uh, effective. They are either inadequate, they are either inadequate or ineffective because um, when the government, for example, tackles, uh, use, uses uh, a measure to tackle this information as an individual entity, sometimes they will miss some aspects of the manifestation of this information, aspects that can be clarified by another stakeholder, like a civil society organization, or like a, uh, like a journalist. So uh, when they miss that aspect, it means the measure put in place will not be effective. And in order to ensure that this measure 
are effective, it is not just the government. Well, I took it as an example. Also, civil society are taking measures. Uh, private sector uh, is are taking uh, private sector companies are taking measures, but it doesn't always work well because they miss, they are missing some aspects. In order to make it work, in order to ensure that it works well, uh, we've uh, we've found as a solution that those actors should come together and collaborate and put together their competencies, their skills, their uh, various expertise, expertises in order to, uh, to jointly act against disinformation. Thank you so much, Simone. Uh, I think you touched quite well on the range of disinformation te uh, techniques and also the actors uh, responsible for perpetu perpetuating this information, particularly online. So now maybe we turn to our second speaker, Charlotte. Charlotte, you are working as operations director at Lie Detectors, an, an, an EU-wide journalist-led news literacy organization. Your main objective is to empower school kids and their teachers in Europe to act as powerful lie detectors and critical thinkers, which is much needed in a world that is facing increasing propaganda and distorted facts online. You do this by providing schools with fact-checked online content, helping students and teachers to understand news media and make informed choices. At the same time, Charlotte, you advocate for media and information literacy with European policymakers. So Charlotte, why did lie detectors decide to focus on building media literacy of school kids? And what have you learned from your experiences in the classrooms, but also from your advocacy work? Well, thank you so much, Eden, for the question and um, hi to all of you. I'm really thankful to be part of this discussion um, and to at least virtually be with all of you in Addis. And before I address your question, I want to give a brief shout out to Africa Check because uh, when Lie Detectors was founded almost six years ago, they were one of the first organizations that we spoke to because already at that time, Africa Check was not only doing fact checking, but also sending journalists into schools, which is a large part of the work that we do at Lie Detectors. So Lie Detectors is an independent media literacy organization, and we work to counter the corrosive effects of disinformation and polarization on democracy. Um, we are active in five European countries. We currently work with more than 250 journalists. And by the end of this year, we expect uh, to have visited more than 1,300 classrooms. And we fulfill our mission, as you said, Eden, by empowering school kids and their teachers to tell fact from fake online, to understand how professional journalism works, and to apply basic journalistic skills. And we, we do that really practically by enabling journalists to go into schools and create moments of honest and authentic exchange. Um, why do we focus on school kids? Because we are convinced that fact checking alone won't do the job. Um, we think that everybody needs the skills to assess and critically think about information. And young kids and, and kids in school are actually a high risk group for this and misinformation because they are targeted on channels that can't be monitored and they are largely navigating them by themselves. So without their teachers or even their parents present. Of course, in terms of logistical possibilities, schools are a place where we can where we can reach uh, these kids. Um, but yeah, it's not only that the kids benefit from it, but also the journalists, because they learn a lot about how this generation uses um, the news and consumes it. And then in addition to that, we also more and more train teachers directly because we know that they really are the key allies to ensure that media literacy education is embedded in day-to-day -day teaching. And on your second question about what we've learned, um, I think I have you know, a message of empowerment because we've really learned that if we approach digital literacy training in a way that is age appropriate, in a way that keeps the teacher safe, and in a way that meets the children where they are, we can already get a lot done. 
and teachers are really motivated, even more so since COVID. But they also tell us that they often don't really have time to teach media literacy, that there is too little recognition for their efforts, or simply that they themselves don't really possess the skills to teach the subject or this issue. Um, and I have to say, I can sympathize because it can be quite a daunting task to discuss media literacy with children, given that they inhabit and navigate a very different information world than their teachers do. And in terms of advocacy, um, so we continually evaluate the feedback and the findings from our, from our work, which enables us to feed these results to policymakers almost in real time. And we are seeing some changes um, as the OECD and the European Commission are increasingly backing the idea that journalists have very important skills to pass on. And also there is a growing desire to see um, a greater number of financially independent organizations acting in this space so that the, re the reliance on media platforms to fund um, them can be reduced. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I think you touched upon a very important element in this discussion, which is media literacy, and I think also bringing in a unique context as well. As you said, focusing on children who are a high-risk group in this um, in countering disinformation. So now I'd like to turn your attention to Slido again. So we have a third question that we would like to bring your attention to, and the question is, in one word, how are you concerned by disinformation? So again, for those of you who are just joining us, either online or in person, we have a live quiz app that we are using to participate with you, the audience. Um, so please take a few seconds to uh, add your responses there. Okay, um, so Odanga. You are a journalist and a fellow at the Mozilla Foundation and a co-founder co of Odipo Dev. You're also the go-to expert in Kenya for anybody who wants to talk about disinformation. You investigated closely on the role of social media companies on spreading disinformation in Africa, especially on the case of the Kenyan elections that occurred this summer. So Odanga, what is the role of private sector actors in tackling disinformation? And what are some, some of the good practices of collaboration between social media companies and other stakeholders? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so my name is Odanga and I currently am a fellow at the Mozilla Foundation. Um, I think the role of private sector players when they're not profiting from disinformation um, or, rather when wherever, or rather, whenever they're not profiting from disinformation that is spread on their platform itself, um, is essentially to try and tackle it as much as possible and you know, keep it from spreading as far as they currently are letting it do. They have had a few successes in terms of you know, establishing the right kind of partnerships, such as partnering with civil society, and partnering with um, fact checkers and instilling policies um, that essentially allow them to detect um, disinformation within, um, within their platforms. But at the same time, I would say that in many cases, we should think about this as being pleased with some of their efforts, but not necessarily satisfied with them. And this is mostly because, like I mentioned, um, we have a case whereby what really has been developed by social media companies and social media platforms is not only an engine of radicalization as we have seen with many other conspiracy theories and attempts at disinformation such as the great replacement theory. Um, what we have is a perverted business model um, that relies on surveillance advertising and you know, or rather relies on surveillance advertising and does not respect um, the rights to privacy for a lot of people, and therefore um, is in essence actually me metastasizing the disinformation problem that is being brought about by, um, or rather that is being pushed by malicious actors onto these platforms and might not necessarily be protecting the users of these platforms um, from the harmful effects that disinformation can cause. So, you know, there is a very, very 
clear amount of platform accountability and accountability work that needs to be done to call these private sector players out um, and ensure that we are actually able to achieve some form of information justice. Because I think just as the previous speaker had mentioned, um, fact checking alone is not enough. Um, and even in some cases, media literacy alone is not enough, right? Um, there has to be a very clear accountability mechanism to hold these platforms to account because a lot of the time, the biggest problem with misinformation and disinformation is not that it's unpublished, right? Um, a big problem with misinformation and disinformation, especially in this internet age, is largely because it is algorithmically amplified by these companies and because of the engagement-based al algorithmic amplification by these companies within their platforms, they also end up profiting from misinformation and disinformation. This is a very serious problem. People die from all of these things. So what do we do about that? How do we you know, be able to get some compensation from these companies for the cases where there are very clear causes of harm? There are trillion dollar companies that are completely failing to invest in keeping their users safe. This is an extractive model that is based on taking data from marginalized populations across the world and in return they end up making a ton of money from it. So, you know, my main thing and a lot of the investigations that I do about it um, focuses on and trying to understand what exactly are these failures and what can we go ahead and do about them. Thank you so much, uh, Odanga. I think mentioning the right, uh, mentioning the role of social media in in perpetuating or even worsening disinformation is a very key or critical uh, element of our discussion. Um, and also, you touched upon accountability, which I think is really important um, for these social media giants in protecting all their users from uh, from disinformation. Uh, great, so now I'm, I'm looking at the responses from the audience um, on our previous question, and I think it's quite quite um, visible. Uh, it visibly reflects the diversity of um, our audience, both online and in person, So, and that's really essential to our conversation. So thank you for taking part in that. Simona, coming back to you. In your recent report, Disinformation Pathways and Effects on Democracy and Human Rights in Africa, you compared the effects of disinformation in five different African countries, Ethiopia, Cameroon, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda. What are the most effective measures to tackle disinformation that doesn't affect human rights, and what can we learn from these experiences? Okay. Um, I think it is it is important to uh, to underline that these countries were chosen um, they, they were taken as sample for region, regional representativeness so we tried to have as much we have to, we tried to have one country per sub region in africa even if uh, not africa for now is not uh, represented but the other criteria was looking for countries where we have had um, elections or po high political high political protests in the last uh, last five years because that was the focus of the of the report. It was about disinformation during elections or periods of high political protest. So, um, looking at in, at those countries and the uh, occurrences of disinformation found and the measures put in place by actors, I think it is very, very difficult to speak about uh, a measure to tackle this information that does not affect human rights. For now, I think, we, I, I think we don't have one. But we have some measures that could go without, for now, could go without affecting human rights. But they are, not, uh, they are still not effective due to uh, some due to some aspect that I'm going to to underline. Those measures are uh, fact checking that uh, was mentioned earlier. Fact checking is the is is an effective me. It's 
a possibly effective measure in that uh, in that sense that you can you you can easily show and clearly easily and clearly show how uh, how a news or an information is false or not false through facts through examples to analysis and of sources and 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 many other and many other things but fact checking is facing other challenges challenges like uh, lack of access to information governments most of these governments uh, of these countries where that we study are very close to uh, to publish uh, to, to publish uh, public information so access to information is not a common good in these countries and uh, in Cameroon for example we don't have a law on access to information we don't have a well established mechanism to ensure that uh, public the public can access information even information that is public that is public uh, uh, information you know government information uh, he spoke about uh, accountability he was talking about platform but i can we can also uh, talk about accountability on governments and governmental agencies so we don't have that information we don't have platform where we can access that information in these countries nigeria is doing uh, is, is, is a little work about that open government partnership open government yes nigerian is working on that and in cameroon you have uh, local initiatives by government uh, cso civil society organizations to ensure that uh, we have uh, open municipalities but but still we don't have uh, we don't have that established mechanism to allow access to information. Well, we have uh, fact checking, and there is also there is also that um, measure that governments generally use to uh, address disinformation. That is uh, raising awareness. Yeah, we are talking about collaboration, uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration. The government try to uh, to gather multi actors like uh, private companies facebook in occurrence like the civil society like journalists when the election the presidential election was approaching in 2018 and i'm talking about cameroon uh, yes and they tried to figure out how to tackle this information how to uh, to fight against this information during the election period and the main activity that they did, that they carried out, was raising awareness. And when they raise awareness, they will send uh, SMS messages to people informing them on the risk that they face about this information, informing them about the sanction that they also risk if they share uh, false news, and about the attitude that they can adopt if they have a dubious uh, message. And when you go through this awareness raising, you see that the sanction comes from the law that is not very clear about what is this information. And when you see the sanction that is very, very high sometimes, it can either uh, lead people to self-censorship. I mean, it can Tackle, maybe it can tackle this information, but at the same time, it will suppress free expression. So when you look about these two measures, fact-checking and uh, awareness raising, you see that there are ways, there are ways in which we can tackle this information without affecting human rights, but they are still, they still have many challenges. And the, the principal the, the 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 main the main way to tackle to use these means without affecting human rights or to face these challenges is to come together i will come back again again and again on the fact of coming together as uh, multi actors multi stakeholders to better do it because if i will take one example this time 
if you are uh, implying, uh, if you are uh, involving civil society or human rights uh, lawyers in the regulation, regulatory processes, it will be easier to do to have uh, provisions against disinformation or even content regulations, uh, content regulations that respect human rights and respect it from uh, international principles of uh, human rights. So that is the, if you bring on board civil society organizations, human rights defenders, lawyers, uh, intergovernmental organizations, you may have the expectations need as a, as a government to do a fair regulatory process to tackle this information. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Simone, for that insightful response. Um, so my next question is for Charlotte. Imagine lie detectors would receive a mandate to advise European and African leaders on how to jointly tackle disinformation. What would be your main recommendations on that front? And what do you think should be prioritized? Thanks so much for this question. And uh, Simone, it was really interesting to hear your thoughts about the challenges of fact checking and, and building on that and repeating what I said earlier, um, as important as fact checking is, um, we really think that fact checking alone won't solve this problem of disinformation. Um, we advocate for media literacy to be an integral part of school and teacher training and an important step in the right direction, which we strongly support, is the OECD's move to integrate critical digital literacy into its school rankings. We think that media literacy should be taught across all subject areas and not be confined to one subject only. And we really need investment in teacher training to achieve this. It's necessary, um, building on what I said earlier, um, to aim for impact among young age groups, because by the time that these students go to university, it can already be too late. Um, I think it's really important that we don't tell kids what to think, but that we tell them that they should think, assess, and question information independently. It's really like um, training a muscle reflex. Um, without taking sides. So um, building on that, it's really important to address the topic in a way that's inclusive, that we keep it light and fun and non-political. And what we really advocate for is that we need students to feel empowered and not frightened. So it's really important to give them very practical tools that they can easily use themselves. So for example, when our journalists um, go into classroom, they show kids how to use a re reverse image search, how they can um, look up images online. But we also think that until that goal is reached until media literacy is embedded in all curricula. Um, our model, which uh, facilitates the secondment of expert into educational settings, works really well as long as training and quality checks are in place, because these trustworthy external actors can make a big difference in a classroom as they have a long, leave a very long lasting impression with their students. Um, speaking from an operations perspective, one really shouldn't underestimate what it takes to make more than a thousand classroom visits per year possible. It's really a significant logistical undertaking because there are so many different stakeholders involved. We're dealing with different countries, education system, which all come with their unique opportunities and challenges. So, um, yeah, additionally, the topic itself, of course, is rapidly evolving. So. Um, it's necessary to have the right systems in place to continuously monitor, control quality, um, and really be on top of, of what's happening in different contexts. Um, lastly, and I think this um, nicely ties in with what we heard earlier, it's very important to safeguard the independence of media literacy education. So funding mechanisms should not hinder this independence, both of education and media literacy work, but also of journalism. 
And yeah, maybe before I close, um, as you've heard, most of our work currently is happening in Europe. But if anyone in the audience um, in Addis or here online would um, like our help in getting a similar initiative started in your context and region, please reach out. Um, my colleague will also put the contact information in the chat. And um, I really look forward to your questions and thoughts during the discussion. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Charlotte. So, Odanga, coming back to the role of social media platform on the spread of disinformation. You investigated different attempts and measures of regulating social media platforms worldwide. What would be your dream scenario for the future? Um, thank you. I, I quite frankly, I'm not sure. Um, I think as a journalist, I like to burn things down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I usually like my. I usually find people asking me what is the solution, and I'm like, but my job is to find problems. Anyway, um, I think my my dream my dream solution in this specific case, I think would be number one. I I think very nuanced intervention from regulators into into you know understanding and trying to regulate the social media and internet industry and not necessarily focusing on you know information control because i feel like a lot of the time when a lot of especially african governments go into the business of trying to actually regulate what happens on the internet they usually like we don't like what people are saying on the internet let us go and try to regulate the internet no what we need to be going back from is we need to try and understand what are the harms that are being caused by the internet and how do we protect the consumers of the internet from those kind of harms. I think that's how we have a conversation that is very nuanced, that protects human rights, right? That is able to protect human rights, but also um, you know, is able to provide regulation into an industry that quite frankly has been allowed to run amok. Um, secondly, I think my second dream scenario would be uh, you know, basically breaking up the big tech companies. I think we have had a, they have had an unprecedented era of domination where they have made trillions of dollars, and they have stifled competition, and basically held captive the ideas of an entire industry. Um, and we need to stop. We need basically imagine a world where Facebook is not the internet. A world where Twitter is not the internet and does not have as much influence at it as it has. There's a very big movement to try and decentralize the internet from many of these big companies so that there's diversity of experience um, on the internet as it was before you know, the advent of many of what we have now come to call big tech, right? Because then we will be able to have a new, you know, a diversity of ideas that is not necessarily dominated by, um, or that, that is not necessarily dominated by a bunch of people in Silicon Valley, and you know we will be able to have you know fresh you know basically fresh thoughts and fresh attempts at you know trying to design what um, social media landscapes are able to look at that take into um, consideration the context of the people, or rather of, of people like us, black and brown people, who um, do also very clearly um, inhabit these kind of spaces. So those are my two dream scenarios. Great, thank you so much for sharing that, Odanga was very insightful. So just a quick reminder now before we navigate into our debate. Uh, we invite you to answer and give your recommendations on tackling disinformation while promoting human rights. So you can include your input via Slido. Again, you will be prompted on the app with a question. Um, so, And also for the online participants on Zoom, uh, you can also do that through the chat box. That's also an option for you. So as we do that, I'd like to open the floor to the audience to share your questions, comments, and or specific recommendations towards the topic of this discussion. We want to hear from as many people as possible, so please do keep your responses to 30 seconds maximum. May I also remind you to please state your name 
where you come from. And if your question is targeted towards any speaker, please also mention that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I am Dr. Mohammed Saleh Mohammed Yassin. I came from the University of Lille in France. Originally, I'm from Sudan, and at the same time, I'm Italian citizen. So I'm joining the unity between the African Union and the European Union, so representing 82 countries currently while I'm here. I'm glad about uh, this, uh, this, uh, these hubs, and I think uh, it will have huge impact yeah, as long as it will be mushrooming to include all the territories of the Africa, uh, of Africa, and uh, maybe uh, create this uh, dreamed uh, future for our uh, generation and the young generation as, as such. This is uh, crucial and uh, it will uh, uh, accelerate the development because now the pace of development uh, which is going is very slow. And as long as we digitalize things, things will, will be accelerated. So uh, from your experiences, what are the um, maybe ideal accelerators which can uh, replicate or maybe um, increase the number of hubs to include all uh, the African, uh, African territories? And uh, in what are the best, uh, or the best way to go forward in order to, have, to make this uh, digital future inclusive, uh, as inclusive as possible. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, uh I come from uh, a civil society in Ethiopia. Mm, my question, uh, I will reflect first on the presentation, um, especially media literacy for children is a great intervention for misinformation, uh, but its its impact is like planting a tree. So it takes a time in the process. Um, but our world, especially for the past some years, and uh, a lot of, uh, some kind of nationalist leaders are growing from both west, east, and even south and north. So they are different nationalist leaders, and those nationalist uh, leaders are uh, weaponizing misinformation to create a mistrust between different uh, groups uh, so that within that chaos they can sustain their power. and. Uh, uh, their interest. Uh, so as an immediate solution for the coming few years, uh, what will be the solution? If you reflect on this, any of the panelists will be my interest. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, uh, hello, my name is Tim, I'm from Russia, and uh, first I would to remark that we in Russia strongly support the idea of big tech regulation by the government or either civil society, but we, all, we see the same, that platforms, the global uh, IT corporations need regulation because they have to take responsibility for what they are doing and how they are making money. Uh, second, I wanted to deliver you a remark about our own experience on uh, fighting disinformation. And I should say that actually we have a big experience, especially recently, and we have come to the idea, not a, maybe idea, but um, an answer that actually content restrictions and removing of misinformation or fakes is not simply effective, as long as if you remove one, the 10 will, uh, will uh, arise. So that uh, our best practice for fighting misinformation, disinformation and fakes is to deliver verified information as wide as possible, maybe somewhere targeted, maybe somewhere very wide, and in some easy consumable way for people. That is our recipe. And we are willing to share our experience with anybody who is interested in fighting disinformation. Thank you so much.
Okay, thank you very much. My name is Tesfaye Noy from uh, Ethiopia, from the judiciary. And thank you for your uh, presentations and insights. Um, how we need to tackle misinformation, disinformation, and hate set speech uh, in line with the protection of the fundamental human rights, I think. Uh, it, it is important to have a discussion on vexing on uh, uh, critical issues. Um, like there needs to be a national dialogue uh, by the elites on the very critical issues that divide societies. Because the elites are the one who fabricates, who prop up uh, disinformation, who prop up hate speech. Therefore, there needs to be a forum in which elites uh, who can discuss, there needs to be a platform that elites can discuss what is their difference. Maybe when you go to the deep of their divisions, it's, it's not a real division. It is for the sake of galvanizing the societies, then they throw up different, different negative uh, and disinformation. Therefore, I think having this national dialogue, having a discussions between different uh, elites is also is very important. The second thing is that there should be a law which should be in line with the international human rights standards, like with the freedom of expressions. Uh, if there is a law which is against international standards, then it affects the freedom of expressions. Here in Ethiopia, we have a hate speech and disinformation proclamations, and we need to be sure that when that law is going to be enacted, it should be in line with the international standards. That's the first thing. The second one is the law enforcement organs, the courts, the judiciaries, should interpret that law as per the international human rights standards. By doing so, uh, the law enforcement organs in the use of implementing that law will not affect the human rights standards. Therefore, implementing that law, enacting that law as per the international standard is also another thing. The third thing is that there should be uh, a responsible usage of internet by the general uh, public. Therefore, there needs to be an awareness creation mechanisms for the use, for the vulnerable, for the vulnerable group, for those who don't get enough access how to use the internet. Uh, if they have been simply using the internet, social medias, which propagates negative thoughts, which propagate disinformations, then they simply succumbed to that idea and they took it as a truth, as a real thing, then they, uh, they, they, could, they could create havoc to the community. Therefore, I think empowering is also very important. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for your question. I think we received some interesting uh, insights and remarks, but I just want to give our speakers a chance to respond and then we can continue the, the dialogue. Okay, there's one more question from the audience. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Jiran Kapushev. Uh, I am a director of Digital Paradigm Public Foundation from Kazakhstan. Well, we uh, had, you know, shut down in January and uh, our Ministry of Information and the Social Development uh, blocked so many websites uh, by disinformation and uh, they can't communicate with uh, uh, social websites and messengers. And uh, I heard that in Nigeria in 2021, uh, Nigerian government blocked um, the Twitter and in January 2022, uh, Twitter and the um, Nigerian government uh, made an agreement and uh, Twitter uh, should open uh, the own office and register a company, appoint a representative, pay taxes and uh, register Nigeria on your on portal to for direct communications between government officials and Twitter to manage prohibited content that violates the rules of the Twitter community. So I uh, I want to say uh, we um, we uh, had uh, uh, like you know this uh, draft law uh, to register company in Kazakhstan uh, to make. Um, a communication between government and the social websites. You did it, but uh, we did not. And uh, uh, I would ask uh, government 
uh, Nigerian government can use their legal method to uh, control content in uh, Twitter or other social uh, websites. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for your question. Um, Odanga, I'd like to give the floor to you uh, if you want to respond to some of the questions that have been made. Yeah, I think I can respond to some of the remarks and questions that have been made. Um, so I think I, uh, from some of the comments that I've seen, you know, around, you know, your concerns around, you know, what does, you know, very primary exposure to, you know, social media being the main, your main exposure to the internet, the kind of effects that it can have. Um, I think someone asked the question of how do we replicate this to make it more inclusive? Um, and then I think we also talked about, again, the issue of, you know, media literacy and the limits that it can have. You see, all of these, again, tie back to the big, some of the big, big problems that we are currently seeing on the internet, which is that the internet right now is incredibly centralized um, amongst some very, very big companies that dominate what your experience on the internet is likely to be. And that is likely to have a lot of effects in terms of how people use the internet, right? In terms of how we even decide to tackle misinformation and disinformation. You know, the, I think the saddest part about even how we talk about this issue is that, you know, these topics are largely framed um, by some of these very companies that end up propagating this misinformation. But there are various, very many different types of um, information of information disorder out there, but because of the sheer dominance of these companies, you know, we end up with a problem. Uh, we end up with some of the problems that all of you have highlighted. So thinking about what decentralization of the internet looks like is a very big part and has to be a very important part of the advocacy that any of you do. Um, it's very important to actually, you know, think about what does the internet look like away from some of these platforms um, and not in a forceful way but in a way that you know is able to actually um, provide a nutritious experience in terms of using the internet it's almost you know information diets are just the same as nutritional diets if you eat one thing you're going to end up um, malnourishing yourself in a certain way the same thing actually is the case with a lot of the platforms that we're using and that's why they've become incredibly um, problematic. Thank you so much, Odanga. And now I'd li also like to give uh, the chance for Sh Charlotte. Um, if you'd li like to address some of the remarks and questions that have been made so far. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much. I found it really fascinating to hear all these various perspectives because to me it really shows that the challenges um, are so context dependent and it will be really hard to find a one size fits all solution. But I want to build on um, the comment and question that um, our colleague from the civil society um, organization in Ethiopia made about the limits of media literacy training and education. And I really like this picture that you painted about planting a seed and I very much um, agree with it. Um, I think it's definitely, I mean, this panel, I think, really illustrates that we need several approaches to solving uh, this problem and they need to need to go hand in hand. Um, I do think that planting the seed also can have quite an immediate effect in the sense that, so for example, very practically, if our journalists speak to kids in the classroom, you know, we, from the feedback we get, we realize that they say, okay, and going forward, I want to be a little bit more cautious about what information I'm passing on. I want to be a detective a little bit myself. I want to check information a little bit more. So while I'll agree that we're planting a seed and it'll take time to grow, I think we can have some immediate effects, at least when it comes to, to the spreading of um, disinformation. And uh, I just want to emphasize, I mean, I think we all agree that disinformation is not a new phenomenon. It's ha It has existed um, uh, for a very, very long time, but of course now the means are very different by how it, um, it spreads. And um, the problem, of course, I mean, we talk about school kids, but um, 
they are not the only age group that needs um, media literacy education. And so I would welcome to see many more initiatives taking this on also for, for age groups that we're not covering. Um, but I think in the meantime, there, there are um, things while the tree grows, um, like supporting quality journalism that are really indispensable um, to, to help us kind of bridge, bridge this gap until the tree is fully up and standing. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, and now I'd also like uh, to ask Simona to, to respond to some of the questions and remarks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eden. Uh, I will go for the first question where uh, Odonga have said uh, very, very much about. I think I, I don't have much to add, but I just wanted to bring out the fact of uh, access to access to infrastructure, media infrastructure, as a, a, in, in all levels, as one of the ways to make it as uh, inclusive as possible. That's because most of the time, when, when, we, when we talk about the measures to tackle this information, these, uh, the populations of rural area, I will talk about that, are all, all, always almost always left behind we consider where we consider people who have uh, access to inf who have access to the, to the media to mainstream media and maybe social media but we generally don't consider those who don't even have access to 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 those uh, to, to to those uh, media and uh, information means but they are still exposed to uh, so disinformation, they can be. They, they are just uh, victims of uh, disinformation. So, if uh, making it as inclusive as possible, considering the rural population, would be uh, taking uh, into account the way in which they to access to information. If we don't, if, if we cannot uh, expand media infrastructure to their level when we are doing. Uh, uh, when we are doing sensitization or raising awareness uh, of uh, on this information, we can at least uh, make sure that they access that information in the way that they are informed in their in their places, like going through uh, community community radios, community uh, means of access to information, even from from mouth to to ears, like uh, sometimes they do, because that is the main the main way how they are exposed to this information, people will just hear about it and then spread with their mouth and it reaches that population that, is, uh, that have no way to verify information or the information will be flagged as, uh, as fake, but they will not even know that that information they are believing in has already been flagged as, as fake. So that is um, the part of uh, inclusivity that I can bring in. The other question was about weaponizing uh, this information. I'm not sure I didn't, uh, I, I'm not sure I hear it. Uh, I got it very well. Um, what, I get, what, what I got from it was uh, how do we do with the government's weaponizing disinformation, right? Well, what we found so far is that weaponizing these informations, they are able to do that because they have already set the, you know, the bullets. <laughs> they, they, they have, the, the, the disinformation is, the, is like the weapon and uh, the bullets are right behind and the bullets are into regulations. The bullets are into the gaps that exist, either into regulations, either into the, uh, I was talking about mechanisms of access to information. When the government have not set that, that mechanism, when the government have uh, enacted a law that is not clear, or that, is, uh, that have many gaps, that, a law that has many gaps on uh, the definition of this information, it is very easy for the government to use that law to uh, to use that, that law against population, against uh, freedom of expression, against dissenting voices, against criti criticizing uh, voices. So, 
I don't know if I <laughs> if I point out to the to your concern, but that is the way how we see it from what we've done so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone. I'll just turn to our online audience now, um, but first I'll share some recommendations that have been added so far for jointly tackling disinformation whilst promoting human rights. So the first one is address anonymity on social media, allowing for the identification of people and organizations that spread disinformation. Empowering people to check their sources, bringing people together, multi-stakeholder actors from different um, industries to address the issue through dialogue and stopping the business model which is benefiting from disinformation. Um, I think this has also been echoed by Od Odanga um, and stronger laws that could find common ground on an international level. So now we'll just take two questions from our online audience. So the first one is what could be done if the global, if the global digital pl platforms refuse to cooperate with law enforcement of other countries regarding illegal and harmful content like incitement to violence, organized disinformation campaigns, hate crimes on their platforms, or refuse to establish an official representation in their countries? And in this situation, what would be the responsibility of states regarding the bad behaviors and non-cooperation of their respective platforms, work under their jurisdiction regarding the content that undermines the security, stability, and public order of these other countries, or content that harms the lives, health, and rights of users? So that's quite a packed uh, question. <laughs> um, but if, um, if the speakers have uh, anything to respond to that, um, and also closing remarks would be great. Thank you. Okay. I think I can respond to that. Um, well, it's such a loaded question. Could you read maybe the first one? <laughs> because I think it needs multiple answers. Yeah, I'll read the first one quickly yeah. again. So what could be done if the global digital platforms refuse to cooperate with law enforcement mm -hmm. regarding illegal and harmful content, mm -hmm. like incitement to violence, organized disinformation, campaigns, hate crimes, mm. or they refuse to establish an official representa re representation in some countries? Okay, so those are two actually two separate things. So on the case of um, you know harmful content on their platforms, they actually do tend to comply. I'm actually yet to see a case whereby a platform has completely refused to take down a piece of content that has been identified by multiple people to be problematic, harmful, and you know, and against the law, and they've actually refused to take it down. I mean, Kanye West was just suspended from Twitter again today. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else is following that news, um, but you know, that's another. Just that's just one example. I think. In the cases whereby they are requested to take down something that is clearly um, in violation of certain rules and laws, and it has been identified and there is pressure to take that down, it does go down. Okay. Now, in the case of putting in representatives um, within certain jurisdictions, we must be able to ask why are they being asked to put in certain representatives within those jurisdictions. Um, within the EU, I know that the DSA is going to mandate that a lot of the, I think that there will be some form of representation. I think, if I'm not wrong, I hope I'm, maybe someone can fact check me on that, but I do know that representation will be required within the EU, right, for platforms that surpass a certain number of users. But, you know, it depends on why are they being asked to do that? Some countries ask that, ask that representatives are within their regions for authoritarian purposes. In Brazil, we have seen uh, several times where um, employees of social media companies have been arrested. Same thing in India. Um, and that also poses a kind of threat um, to the individuals that do actually end up taking those jobs. So it's very important to ask why. Now, in the case whereby they do refuse and they deem that the reasons they've been asked to put in a representation within those countries is not valid enough for them, they exit. Yeah, they just say, you know what, we're not going to offer, we're a business after all, right? We're not going to put our people in danger or we're not willing to comply with this. It's a free market. They just pull out. Yeah, um, and let anyone else uh, take over the mantle. So, and it has happened before, by the way. It has happened before. 
Um, it happened in Australia a few years back when they literally said, we're not going to comply with any of your laws, we're out. And, you know, they had to come to the negotiating table. So those are now, you know, some of the nuances that we have to consider when it comes to such questions. Thank you so much, uh, Odanga, for that. Um, so due to time constraints, uh, we're going to have to wrap up the discussion now. Um, and I wouldn't do that, of course, without firstly thanking our audience, both online and offline, for taking part in this important conversation and by sharing your individual voices and unique perspectives. And of course, secondly, our remarkable speakers, um, Simone, Odanga, and Charlotte, for your input and really embodying the multi-stakeholder dialogue that is deeply rooted within the framework of this topic. On behalf of the African Union, European Union Digital for Development Hub, I thank you all for your participation today. Thank you. <laughs>